Hello there and happy Friday. My name is Julie Hirschberg. I am the owner of Reactive Physical Therapy and Wellness. And we've been doing these live Friday videos for a couple of years now, pretty consistently every week. And it's one of the highlights of my week because I get to talk through a lot of the things that we're learning here at Reactive and learning through the people we work with and other therapists. And I just get so excited to hear from you all. And today we are taking um, a, a turn down the road of ataxia. Uh, we talked a little bit about it last week. And we're next week we're doing our live mini course on ataxia and updates. And whenever I think of ataxia, I think of my favorite part of the brain, which is the cerebellum. Um, and really it's a close tie between the cerebellum and the brainstem, to be honest, but they are very well connected. And that's something that we're gonna talk about today is what is it about these connections um, in the brainstem and the cerebellum? Um, how does that contribute to the cerebellum being set up to integrate so much information? So that's what we're going to kick off with is a little bit of the anatomy piece. The, then we got to talk about the cerebellar role in motor learning. What do we know now? What is new? Um, because that's kind of the primary thing that we think of as physical therapists and occupational therapists with the cerebellum. And then we're going to talk about cognition in the cerebellum. So this is something that is more newly understood of a role in the cere cerebellum. So let's start with a little bit of anatomy. And here's one of the reasons I love the cerebellum. It's pretty small um, structure. It really only takes up 10% of the volume of the brain, but it actually contains the vast majority of all the neurons in the whole central nervous system. And the, its structure is what allows it to, to have all these neurons. It's quite beautiful if you've ever dissected it, um, looked at it um, under a microscope even. It's got these beautiful folia that look like a tree and it's just really densely packed neurons. And that's one of the features of it neuroanatomically that allows it to have so many functions and integrate so much information. Now, if we can briefly hearken back to neuroanatomy days, if you will allow me, um, the cerebellum can be broken up several different ways. And actually, I remember when I learned this in neuroanatomy being kind of confused because there's functional areas of it and then there's lobes to, um, well, so anterior lobe, posterior lobe are the biggest ones. Um, and then you also have the flocular nodular lobe, which is just a fun word to say. Um, and then we also have functionally distinct areas and a lot of different inputs and outputs. So some of the primary pieces um, that are driving information to the cerebellum and then the cerebellum is sending information back are the vestibular system, the oculomotor system, so especially that interface between vestibular and oculomotor uh, with our eyes um, and our eye head movement control, the sensory and motor cortexes, that's what we think of primarily for the cerebellum for that coordination piece, cognition, and something that's a little newer that I definitely wanted to talk about today because I was reading this really interesting part of the Handbook of Clinical Neurology. It had a whole chapter on emotion and social processing areas in the cerebellum. And when you look at it, I actually printed out a really cool figure from this. This is chapter five in the cerebellar subchapter of the Handbook of Clinical Neurology. So hearkening back to neuroanatomy days here in some of those cross sections of the cerebellum, but really what it's pointing out are these key functional areas of motor, sensory motor, cognitive, and emotional. So something I want to kind of add to our understanding of the cerebellum today is the green, the emotional pieces. They're primarily in the posterior cerebellum, the posterior lobe, and the posterior vermis. And this is a little newer in understanding um, just in the last 20 years, which 
to me is new in terms of neuroanatomy, because even then when I was in PT school 20 years ago, this was just starting to be understood. So we have these functional areas, sensory uh, or sensory motor, motor, emotion, cognition, and this emotional, emotion social is a newer understanding. Um, and I think it's really interesting. So how have they found this and why now? And a big piece of that is functional MRI imaging. So they can look at people during um, emotional experiences or neutral experiences and see that that posterior vermis and some of the posterior cerebellar lobe actually are processing some of that emotional information. Isn't that fascinating? I, I really didn't know that. So that those posterior structures in the cerebellum make up um, some of these emotional processing areas. And there was one really interesting thing in this book chapter where they talked about two separate areas. So experiencing your own pain, um, which includes more of the autonomic processing, tends to um, light up the posterior vermis of the cerebellum more than if you um, are having empathy for somebody else's brain. So that own experience, it comes back to some of the stuff we talked about last week about the autonomic nervous system having input into the cerebellum. So something that I really learned about um, reading through some of these chapters on the cerebellum is that it's, it's way more complex at integrating pieces of information from all of our systems and bringing them, uh, bringing them together. So, um, so that is one piece of that functional integration piece of the cerebellum. And it's really set up very nicely because it's getting these, the inputs from several systems and outputs to several systems. And one of those newer systems that we know is the limbic system and the paralimbic structures. Um, so neat, just like kudos to the cerebellum for taking it all in, um, and why it's called the little brain, right? So let's, let's shift gears here. So cerebellum is integrator, Cere cerebellum role in motor learning. This is one of the most important roles that impacts us as therapists and impacts people's movements. Um, we know that the cerebellum is involved in motor learning and in particularly learning from errors or error-based learning. So this is pretty well established. Um, this refers to, so when, um, when we learn from our errors, we have adaptation. And then that adaptation helps us to meet the demands of our environment, of the body, of changes in what's being presented to us in the environment. And um, in a recent study, um, they actually looked at, could we improve some of the, the motor learning by, um, by changing the way that, um, that error signal may be occurring because we we know um for example if you've ever um worked with somebody with ataxia with a cerebellar disorder a response to a perturbation will result in um, a lot of potentially excessive movements and overshooting and undershooting um typical of ataxia so in this study what they found is that if instead of a, a really strong perturbation, if they gradually increased that, um, that change in the environment and that, that error, that a person with ataxia could learn it more and hold on to that learning longer. So I think that's a really promising um, finding in, in the study and um, something of a take home from the motor learning perspective is that knowing there's an impairment in learning from errors, can we change how much of an error we might induce and gradually improve their motor learning that way? So that's something that I've been thinking about a lot as I set up my treatment 
um, for, for people with cerebellar um, disorders. The other thing that um, some of the studies have showed us is that people with cerebellar disorders can learn pretty well under a closed loop reinforcement and they can retain that, especially with, um, with reaching. Reaching is a big thing that's been researched. So that is uh, better for motor learning in a cerebellar disorder um, as opposed to large error-based learning. So I think that is another take home for us for, for how we might approach our therapy for, with somebody with ataxia, which is what we'll talk about next week too, because we'll have our mini course and Lauren and Chelsea have put together a lot of the most recent literature, um, some really great cases so that um, I'm gonna draw on that as I hop in here next Friday, cause it'll be the day after our course and, and give you some take home points about what we learned there from, from a treatment standpoint. And when it comes to treatment and understanding, um, we have to talk about cognition. And um, so, you know, if we go backwards here, we talked about emotion, emotional processing, social behavior actually being part of the function of the cerebellum. We talked about motor learning and some of the recent studies that um, show us that it's possible and how we can, can um, maybe change our practice settings to improve motor learning um, with, with somebody with ataxia. But cognition plays a big role as well. And again, this is something new in the last 20 years, something I didn't learn in PT school. Um, and a lot has been learned in that time about the cerebellar role in cognition and the changing role based on if it's developmental, like early on versus you're in, as, as an adult, which I think is very interesting. And a lot of this stuff they have learned as they've done functional imaging. So the technology has gotten a lot better um, for people, for us to really understand. And as we've grown to understand other disorders like autism, we know that there, there looks to be a role of the cerebellum in autism, for example. So the main roles that we know the cerebellum takes on in, co in the cognitive world are with sequencing behavior and executive function. And these again are from fMRI studies where they've looked at cerebellar activation during these types of cognitive tasks. So um, related to using working memory um, or executive function, um, attention and timing of a task, have all shown to be related to, to the cerebellum. And this implicit and procedural learning, which is also a cognitive, uh, cognitive task, which carries over into our motor learning, um, is also part of the cerebellum. So these are all things that we have to consider as um, potentially part of our treatment program when we're working towards rehabilitation and recovery in ataxia. So we want to consider the, the impact that that person may have on their cognition and how we might incorporate that into treatment and maybe even a referral to improve that cognitive piece. And I have really found with that, then we can have improvement in the motor learning pieces that we're striving for as physical therapists a lot. Um, if we can work with speech therapy or neuropsychology to work on some of the executive functioning and the sequencing pieces that come along with the cognitive piece. Now, have I always thought about this as in ataxia? No, I have not. Uh, I think it comes up more when I think about other disorders that affect some of the cortical structures, but cognition is a functional part of the cerebellum. And so this is something to think about, to test and to incorporate into, into treatment. So what did we talk about today? We talked about the functional setup, the anatomy of the cerebellum that allows it to be an integrator from multiple areas. So this was our lovely uh, diagram here where we could really see those functional areas between motor blue, sensory motor with that lighter blue, cognitive, look at all those cognitive areas, and emotional. So the cerebellum is set up 
to integrate that information. We talked a little bit about the latest research in motor learning and about cognitive as well. Um, and really, I think it just gets me more excited about neuroanatomy. I, I mean, I know I already am, but I just think the intricacy of this, um, the way it takes in information from us and the world around us and helps us move in really meaningful ways, I just think it's quite beautiful. So thanks for hanging out with me to nerd out on the little neuroanatomy today and the cerebellum. Um, but I think diving in to this level, it helps me understand what I can do clinically um, to help people with something like ataxia. So thanks for joining me today. If you want to dive in deeper, we have our live mini course next Thursday evening, and it's at 6 p.m. Pacific time, but we'll record it if you can't join us live. I think it's going to be a really great dive to apply all of this to multiple different types of cases. And you'll leave with a lot of creative ideas and feeling really hopeful that you can help somebody with ataxia. So I hope you'll join us next week. Um, but if not, I'll see you next Friday. Thanks for joining me today.